Welcome, everyone. Uh, my name is Samantha Oakley from the ALA's Public Programs Office. I'm pleased to introduce today's webinar, Reconciling Communities, Planting Seeds of Change Through Cultural Education and Truth-Telling. Before we start, I'd like to make a few quick announcements. Today's webinar is presented by ALA's Public Programs Office and the Office for Diversity, Literacy, and Outreach Services, with support from ALA's Cultural Communities Fund. To learn more about the Cultural Communities Fund or make a contribution, visit ala.org slash ccf. Hopefully, many of you are familiar with Programming Librarian, a website of ALA's Public Programs Office. We have a lot of program ideas and an online learning library full of free webinars just like this one. Finally, a couple of notes about our virtual classroom. Only our presenters have microphone access, but you are welcome to type your questions or comments in the chat box. We will have time at the end for Q&A. Also, if you have any technical issues, please send a private message to Colleen Barbas, a.k.a. PPO Admin. To do so, hover over PPO Admin in the upper right-hand corner of your screen and click pri Start Private Chat. Now, I'd like to introduce our speakers for this afternoon. First up is Melissa Swatsky. Melissa is a professional and, current, and writer currently living in, on unceded Wet'suwet'en territory in Smithers, British Columbia. She serves as the Program and Event Coordinator at Smithers Public Library. Melissa has published articles, essays, and poetry in various literary journals, magazines, and poetry anthologies. She has an MFA in Creative Writing from the University of British Columbia and is pursuing an MLL, MLIS degree through the University of Alberta. Presenting with Melissa is Wendy Wright. Wendy has always loved connecting people with stories, ideas, and information in various formats. As director of the Smithers Public Library, she views the pu public they serve as not only an audience, but also a rich source of information. Wendy worked in bookstores and the publishing industry for nearly two decades before pursuing a library technician diploma and stepping into the endlessly creative world of libraries. With that, I'd like to turn things over to Melissa. Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Melissa, as uh, Samantha just shared. Thank you for taking the time to attend our webinar today. But before going any further, we wish to acknowledge the ancestral, traditional, and unceded Skidamden territory of the Wet'suwet'en Nation, from which we're speaking to you today. Uh, Masai, and thank you. So what I just uh, read for you there is a traditional acknowledgement of the territory, which is something that we uh, say at pretty much every adult event or programming that we put on at the Smithers Public Library. And this is a sign of, of respect and also an intention to normalize this as general knowledge in our community. And there's also a link down there on the slide uh, as something that we, we pulled that script from. The Smithers Bridging Committee put together that resource called Acknowledging with Switching Territory and which is hugely, hugely helpful for us. So before we continue, just a quick note about some terminology we're going to be using throughout the webinar. We will use the terms First Nations, Aboriginal, and Indigenous somewhat interchangeably throughout the seminar. And when we use Wet'suwet'en, that refers to the nation in which the town of Smithers is located. And when we do use the term Indian, it will be in the context of its historical usage. And also, settler re refers to any non-Indigenous person in the community, both uh, recent immigrants or people who have been here for generations who are non-Indigenous. Just a quick overview of what we're intending to share with you today. Uh, basically, this long, very rewarding process we went through to develop and deliver a really rich learning experience that benefited both our community and ourselves and our library. So we'll just run through why we chose this particular event, uh, who we ended up partnering with, and what we hoped to accomplish. And just a quick note that also, due to time constraints, we, we won't be covering some of the details that are already broken down in the program model, which is on the ALA's Programming Librarian website. But there will be time for questions at the end. Hello, I'm Wendy Wright, and I'm the director here at the Smithers Public Library. So let's start off with a bit of background to help place this library event within its larger context. 
Here in Canada, a piece of federal legislation called the Indian Act was enacted in 1876. This act gave the government control over virtually every aspect of Indigenous peoples' lives, from use of land and resources to travel, governance, and finance. It outlawed cultural practices and languages, renamed people with European names, and created reserves and residential schools. Indian residential schools in Canada were government-mandated, church-run institutions created to break the transmission of Indigenous culture between one generation and the next. Attendance was mandatory, and parents could be imprisoned for refusing to cooperate. Over 150,000 children lived at 130 residential schools between 1870 and 1996. They were forbidden to speak their own language, and abuse, disease, and malnutrition were common. The odds of dying in a residential school were slightly higher than those of a Canadian soldier entering the Second World War. Between 2008 and 2015, the National Truth and Reconciliation Commission traveled across Canada collecting testimony from more than 6,000 survivors. Their report is available in print and online, as are their 94 calls to action. The calls to action are a challenge to our society to effect positive change. They include sections on education, museum and archives, and language and culture. So what is reconciliation? And in the context of our event, this is a very good question that we continually ask throughout the, the whole process. And what we, what we came to in the end was that it, it really is an ongoing process. It will take generations. This is not something that will happen in our lifetime, let alone at, at one event. But um, another thing we also realized is that it means different things to different people. Uh, some of our partners sort of helped us realize that uh, some Indigenous people uh, see it as a government initiative and therefore something to be distrusted, which is understandable considering some of the things that Wendy just shared. And some settlers also you have a perception that you know it's just about money and restitution. Uh, so some these, these quotes here kind of get at where, where we were going with it and where we we hope the rest of the country goes with it. And Justice Murray Sinclair's quote talks about that, that ongoing process, that it's really about rebuilding you know, a broken relationship. And I, I really love Richard Wagamuse's quote, that reconciliation begins when you lean over the fence and ask me how I am in my language. And I, I love how that also touches upon the revitalization of First Nations languages, who re really whose very survival was endangered by the policies of yeah, Indian residential schools and the Indian Act. So where did the idea for this particular event come from? A few years ago, I heard someone ask, what are our community's values? And I thought this would be a great topic for a facilitated conversation in the library. Sometime later, a local representative from the Ministry of Aboriginal Relations and Reconciliation dropped by to brainstorm ways to promote and share Indigenous culture locally. A number of initiatives grew from that meeting, and the community conversation idea morphed into a discussion about what reconciliation might look like here in Smithers. Our biggest question at that time was, who will facilitate this important conversation? Our Northwest Library Federation director and the ministry rep researched facilitators and funding sources, discovering a nonprofit called Reconciliation Canada who provides speakers, facilitators, and workshops for a fee. They do excellent work, but were beyond our budget and could not speak to our specific community's experience. We also discovered that two British Columbia public libraries had already held events around reconciliation the Lynn Valley branch of the North Vancouver District Public Library and the Squamish Public Library generously shared a wealth of information with us that helped to shape our event, create materials, avoid pitfalls, and find ways to measure and extend our impact. We would like to take this opportunity to thank them for their leadership and support. So here's why our library undertook this project. 
It aligns with our community needs. Over 10% of our town's 5,400 residents identify as First Nations or Métis. Smithers is also a service hub for a large surrounding area which includes the First Nations Reserve. Racism towards First Nations people has been identified as a historic and ongoing concern in our community. One of our values is that the library builds community by providing a safe place where people can experience a, safe, a sense of belonging. Our library's mission statement mentions inclusivity, community, and lifelong learning. Cross-cultural education, local history, and communicating shared experience to develop an authentic sense of place are integral components of strengthening the fabric of our community. Truth and reconciliation has been recognized as a priority at the national, provincial, and professional level. Canada's 150th anniversary this year thrust truth and reconciliation into the national spotlight. The history of residential schools is now a mandatory part of the BC curriculum, and the Canadian Federation of Library Associations has an Indigenous Matters Committee charged with recommending strategies for implementing the calls to action in libraries. Why hold it in the library? The library is unimposing. Other options included a former church and the Friendship Centre's hall, but these were not considered neutral enough to make everyone feel welcome. The library is a place to learn not only from the collection, but from each other. So now we're going into a few questions that we'd like you to think about with your own community and your own library to see how this lines up for you. And question one is uh, whether there are similar needs in your community. And Melissa has some comments on this. Uh, yeah, so for us, uh, the, the First Nations community was definitely where we, where we saw this need. But uh, for you, it could, it could be quite different. Um, perhaps it is you know, the, the local Native American community or perhaps the Muslim community. A local Black Lives Matter group, um, elite Latin X group, or the LGBTQIA or Two Spirited community. And if you have any any other ideas that are coming to mind around this, please share it with each other in in the chat box. So I guess that first question is, you know, where do you see the most pressing need for this sort of dialogue and understanding? Moving on to question two. Okay. Okay, so question two is do these needs that you've just identified tie in with current issues or initiatives on a broader scale, such as state or province wide, national or international? And this question helps identify opportunities for funding, speakers, resource materials, cross promotion, and support. Uh, just to give you a couple of like examples, uh, here in British Columbia, we might draw upon federal funding for events advancing reconciliation, the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, also known as UNDRIP, the BC government's endorsement of the calls to action, or perhaps the organization Reconciliation Canada. Those are some of the the larger groups or initiatives or current events that are going on that we could tie into or draw upon for such an event. So if you, if you can think of anything that ties in with your community's needs, then, then just uh, think on that or write in the chat box if you'd like to share. And the third question, which is, of course, so vital. Whenever we first consider any new event or service, we have to ask ourselves this question. What are my library's values or strategic priorities that support dedicating resources to these issues? So if you've identified a need, you have an idea, you're thinking about developing something, this question is about the justification for doing so. It's connecting the dots to make sure that you're on track and in alignment with your library's overarching direction and goals. It 
is it's um, about convincing your board and your staff why this is relevant, why you should be doing this, and getting their buy-in. So how would an event focused on reconciliation be relevant in your library? And once again, feel free to share in the chat box. These are big questions that could take some time to think on. And uh, you, can, you can always add something in if it comes to a bit later. And we, it would be interesting to see how many of us have common goals and values coming out of question three. OK, and we'll talk a bit about our goals here. We identified a need. We decided to do something about it. So now we had to be clear about what exactly we hope to achieve. These goals would guide us in deciding the most effective way to create and deliver the event. We deliberately chose not to build the event around a book or a report, since this might exclude people with low literacy or with time constraints. It was important to us that the Indigenous people had the opportunity to make their voices heard and tell the stories that they felt were important to share. Another guiding principle of this event was that it must be specific to this community. Some community members have heard about residential schools, but thought that the local First Nations people were unaffected because no schools were built in Smithers. However, many local children were shipped far away. To understand their neighbors and move towards reconciliation, it was important that newer community members learn of the racism right here in this town such as when some Main Street businesses once displayed no Indians allowed signs, to realize that people they meet have been denied service in the same restaurants they visit today, or treated inhumanely at the very school their children now attend. The last Indian residential school closed in 1996, only one generation ago. That means that many people our own age, parents of our children's classmates, and definitely those children's grandparents, are dealing with the ongoing trauma of that horrific experience. This is not yet in the past. So are you ready? Uh, this is where we're going to speak to a bit more of the personal nature of going, going about organizing or coordinating something like this. So if, if you're endeavoring to take on an event of, of this nature, it requires you know, partnering with a community to which you don't belong, and you know, bringing attention to an experience which is not your own. Uh, so it's pretty imperative you do this with you know, humility and respect and understanding that you're likely going to make mistakes along the way. Uh, our journey was certainly no exception in this regard. And we'll discuss some of those challenges that came up a little bit later. But Wendy and I made a conscious decision to proceed with planning this event and going forward, knowing we'd make these blunders, you know, due to our ignorance or our inexperience in the area, uh, but decided that our, our goals were worth it in the end. And a key moment for me, I think this is something that I, I feel most compelled to share, uh, was when I first uh, met one of our event partners and someone who ended up being a speaker at the event. And you know, I was I was heading off to the meeting, thinking about, oh, here's here's this key key partner. I really you know want to get him on board, and you know how am I going to go about doing that? And I ended up going going in the room, sitting down, and just listening for an hour straight. Uh, at certain points, I was brought to tears. And you know, he just shared his knowledge, his perspectives on Canadian history, much of which is not widely known, at least not yet. And, you know, the essential genocide of its indigenous peoples and the ongoing impacts of that history in the present day and in, in this community. And listening to him and others throughout the process and sharing their perspectives and their stories, it just was a real paradigm shift for both Wendy and I. And it was uncomfortable. It, it was emotional. It was a bit of, you know, a roller coaster in that regard, bearing, hearing some of these stories and bearing some of these truths. So. Yeah, so that, that line there at the bottom of your screen that kept coming up, you know, get comfortable being uncomfortable. As you can see, it took 18 months from the time we decided to bring our community together to talk about truth and reconciliation until the actual day of the event, with a majority of time spent on planning and building relationships. 
More partnerships and events have grown out of relationships developed through the planning process. This is what we had hoped for, that the event itself would be just a beginning. So now we're going to talk about partnerships. When approaching an organization for the first time that you hope to build a relationship with, try to minimize demands on their time. Ask permission to visit them in their space at their convenience. If you arrange a lunch meeting, provide food. And that's something we forgot to do. <laughs> we learned our lesson the hard way. If possible, invite them to participate with an in-kind donation or promotion equipment, speaking, or refreshments rather than by giving money. And make inclusivity a priority over funding potential. Talk to people in the Indigenous community about who to contact. It can be inappropriate to approach some people directly. Introductions are helpful. Think about the best way to reach out, email, phone, or in person. Explain who you are, what you are trying to do, and why. Ask yourself, what are you offering them or their organization in return for their participation? What will they get out of it? We found that people would not commit to participating until they got to know us, or rather, until we got to know them. We met with some people several times, listening to them talk about their culture and history before they agreed to speak at the event. Perhaps they wanted to know that we understood and welcomed their perspective before they committed. So the, the who and why, uh, there's you know, different reasons why you'd want to partner with uh, different organizations and individuals in the community. So this is just to get you thinking about who you might want to you know, be connecting with. And, and for us, it, it was obviously the First Nations community, uh, some of the homeless community, uh, groups with a similar mandate, uh, such as the Bridging Committee, which the library ended up uh, joining, and groups with information that could help uh, serve the event. Uh, for us, that was the local school district, Aboriginal Education Council, and some regional museums were hugely helpful. And groups that will support the intended outcomes or goals of the event. And for us, that was some local and regional government organizations and social service providers, uh, such as a local shelter. And thinking about promotion and having you know a wider reach, uh, the, the town of Smithers was a key, key partner here, local politicians. And then linking up early on with radio, TV, and, and newspaper outlets, both local and regional, to yeah get the conversation you know building well before the event. And you know other groups that are perhaps connected with your intended audience and who could act as a liaison for you. Uh, for us, the Friendship Center was was key here. And obviously, thinking about groups that might have financial support for you you know, your, your regional library federation or nonprofit group. So on your screen now is a list of our partners. And as you can see, the sponsoring partners uh, were just the three there, the federation, the local nonprofit, and the Smithers Bridging Committee. And the rest were either partnering, you know, in kind or in principle. And yeah, that just sort of made this event really feel like a, really a community endeavor as opposed to just something coming from the library. Having so many logos on the poster made it really, as she said, a, a much larger event and and um, it lent credibility to the event, especially for people who identified with the various organizations represented there. It was our hope that community members connected to an organization appearing on the poster would get the message that the larger group they belong to values and supports reconciliation. So in essence, we were inviting the groups we approached to take a leadership, a public leadership role in uh, setting an example for the rest of the community or the rest of their group members by, by standing up um, and saying, yes, this is important. Inviting organizations that we wanted to build relationships with to participate by including their logo was also an easy way for them to partner with us for the first time 
and get to know a bit about our values. So that asked very little of them, but it told them a lot about us, and that's a good way to, uh, to start a relationship. So another question you might want to consider is who might you partner with uh, locally, uh, statewide, or, or nationally even, and, and really who is essential? Who do you really need to be on board? And for some context, for us, if we didn't get the support and partnership of the local band council and the Office of Hereditary Chiefs, we really couldn't go forward with this event. So it was difficult to know at which point in the process we should approach them. So ultimately, we wrote a proposal that detailed some of the goals of the event and current partners and exactly how we hoped that they could participate. And then this information made it easier for them to make a decision. But there was a, a little element of timing there that we you know, had to get some partners on board before we could write that proposal. And so it's sort of a delicate balance there of when, when to approach those essential partners. And yeah, if you have any ideas for partnerships too, feel free to start taking some of those in the chat box so we can get some cross-pollination happening. And on that note, your, your partners, we we'll talked a little bit about group planning and how things went for us at our, our first group meeting. So we had contacted several potential partners from both community-based and governmental or organizations and shared some background about the idea and some information about the similar events that when we mentioned at the beginning of, of the webinar that had taken place in other communities in BC. And we invited some feedback on you know, what we could do here in Smithers. And this led to just a plethora of ideas, you know, a series of multiple events or educational workshops or a lot of people discussed what had already been done in the community, which, which, was, which was great. I mean, we, we had to have that context. And so the information sharing was wonderful, but it didn't really help solidify or move forward our proposed events. Um, so our advice would be to enter these meetings with a really clear idea of what you want to share with your partners so they know what they're getting on board with, but also remain flexible to accommodate their suggestions. And uh, Melissa Mauricia from Bowen Island, hi, Islander. Um, she has a question uh, asking if we can define partners as in kind and in principle. Did you want to speak to that before you go on to the program agenda? Uh, well, the in principle, I mean, I mean, add to this certainly, Wendy, if I don't quite nail it, um, would be primarily about adding their logos to the poster and the promotional materials as that sort of they're supporting it in principle by lending their logo and in kind support would be, I mean, some local museums uh, brought some, some really valuable artifacts for the day and, you know, had that, they were, you know, some local indigenous artifacts and, and that just lent a great feel to the atmosphere on the day, uh, food or some refreshments, things like that. Uh, if you can think of other in kind donations, Wendy, please chime in. Some people volunteer their time as speakers. Oh, of course. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, so anything where that money isn't changing hands. Uh, in kind would be where they are actually are doing something or giving or lending uh, something, but we're not um, paying them for it. And in principle, it is really they're just agreeing to be a part of it uh, publicly. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah, so. As the event drew closer, closer we, we wrote a press release and answered some anticipated questions about you know, what's, what's going to happen at this event and why is the library involved, why should we go. And the board also agreed to close the library for the day. It was a Saturday so that the speaker's personal stories would not be interrupted by regular you know, library operation, which was uh, wonderful. So going to our program here, uh, just to sort of detail how the day looked. We had a brief intro and welcome from both myself and, and Wendy, and then a traditional welcome to the territory with uh, a local chief of, of the Whitsutton Territory. Then we moved on to reconciling the past and uh, two speakers from the local school district, Average and the Education Council, did a visual depiction of, of Whitsutton history in this region. 
as they, as they say a lot, is have been here for time immemorial. So it was a really impactful visual uh, presentation using a string of beads. And in acknowledging the present, uh, there was a speaker who shared her memories of mistreatment and discrimination at a local school. And this was followed by a local First Nations drumming group singing a healing song. And in the Moving to Forward Together section, uh, the mayor of Smithers and a, a local Wet'suwet'en elder and a PhD candidate spoke to a project called the Shared Histories Project, which is a partnership between the town and the Office of Hereditary Chiefs that's going to culminate in a, a published document that paints a more truthful and inclusive history of the town. And the process of unlearning was a Wet'suwet'en storyteller examining the origins of some of the unquestioned assumptions that we, we live with every day and how it's not just about learning what we don't know, but unlearning what we think we know. He used that term unlearning a lot, which really stuck with me. And throughout the event, we, we presented the speaker gifts and honoraria publicly, as is the local First Nations custom. And near the end, we had a, a personal reflection period. And we asked participants to write answers on the back of their program to, to the questions that are they on your screen? Yeah. So, you know, what, what have you learned and what does putting reconciliation into action look like? And what strengths or challenges do, do they see personally in their capacity in our community as we, we move, move into reconciliation? And after this period, we directed people outside for some refreshments and drumming and dancing and encouraged them to, to go up to someone they had never met and, and introduce themselves. And this, this dancing and music was, was just a wonderful welcome release after a really emotional afternoon. So this is what happened. We had expected 40 to 60 people, but we were quietly hoping for 70 to 100. Remember, this is a very small community. And over 150 people showed up in our tiny library which was incredible. Uh, they were mostly ages 35 to 65, and a few Indigenous families brought children, and uh, about half of the audience were settlers and half Indigenous. So the children would spend some time in the presentation and then run, run around outside and play or go into the kids' room and read and come back and forth, and that was, that was really nice. According to the feedback forums, just about everyone learned something. Some Indigenous participants were surprised and encouraged to see so many settlers there wanting to learn more. An older man commented, I've lived here for 37 years and there's so much I didn't know. And right there with that one comment, we knew that we'd been successful. This is what we set out to do. An Indigenous elder told the staff that until hearing the shared histories part of the event, she had not known about the old part of Smithers called Indian Town. The speaker had mentioned her grandfather as one of the people who had lived there, which she had never known about him. So that was a neat surprise. We thought it was essentially going to be one-way learning, and, uh, and it was more of a two-way exchange there in terms of people learning about each other. Um, another elder said, uh, healing is taking place. Today is a great day of healing. And a settler commented to the staff as she left, the library is becoming so much more. That was great to hear, too. Two newcomers reflected on what they had heard and developed their own personal plan for reconciliation. They shared that they hoped to bring their church leaders and the First Nations people together in a talking circle to explore the church's role in the residential schools and reconcile that history with the faith that they hold dear. There were a few challenges. Our agenda was scheduled too tightly. We advertised a two-hour program, which stretched to three hours. And that's because we I suppose we, we weren't accustomed to dealing with such personal and meaningful um, and emotional material when, when the speakers are presenting. 
we're used to people writing out a, a little script or their notes or their PowerPoint and practicing and having it done. But when you're talking to talking about inviting someone to come share their own memories, you're not going to actually say, okay, time. <laughs> that would just be terribly disrespectful and um, and go against the point of, of having them speak. So it did uh, run well over time. Also, stories of injustice and suffering awaken strong emotions. Anticipate conflict and have support available. One person took offense at a speaker and repeatedly interrupted him by shouting and trying to take the microphone. It was an uncomfortable situation and more complex than simple heckling. At the end of the program, we gave him the mic and he described the deplorable conditions his father lives in on the neighboring reserve. It turned out to be very enlightening and powerful. And a truly regrettable incident did occur with the media. Due to the intensely pers personal nature of the stories being shared, a speaker had requested that the media not record the event. Unbeknownst to us, a brand new reporter was in attendance taking photos, and a few days later, that particular speaker's words were quoted at length on the front page of our local newspaper. Real harm was done to the speaker's feelings, and their newfound trust in us was damaged. After meeting with the publisher and the speaker, the library wrote a letter of apology to her in the paper, and we learned that sometimes it's important to be proactive in setting boundaries with the media. So uh, yeah, in the days that followed, it was, it was very valuable for us to debrief with the speakers, uh, particularly around some of these issues that Wendy just spoke to, and also the library staff who attended the event, and individual audience members who, just to see how, how they felt about how it went. And the library has maintained uh, many of the community connections we developed. We march in the Friendship Center's Orange Shirt Day Walk and remain active in the uh, Liberation Committee. So in the past year, the, the topic of reconciliation has gathered momentum in our community. The local government hosted a dialogue workshop led by Reconciliation Canada, which both myself and Wendy attended. And later on, uh, after, after the event, there was an Aboriginal Awareness Training Workshop, which I attended, and it was very rewarding to see that at that event, at that workshop, our event was used as a model for, for a program that you know, could be done regionally. So that was wonderful. And in the works, upcoming, uh, we're going to follow the Squamish Public Library's lead by using our feedback forms to create a report that can be shared back with the community as a bit of a snapshot of where we're at in reference to the terms of reconciliation right now. And hopefully this can assist other, other groups and organizations with identifying opportunities for more initiatives. And we have also hosted or partnered in Indigenous language workshops, uh, Aboriginal music and dance festivals, National Aboriginal Day celebrations, film screenings, and facilitated discussions. And we have one coming up shortly on The Secret Path and creating a new summer reading club position that specifically to enrich the program with Indigenous content and outreach. So, Snekalye, and thank you for listening and attending our webinar. And I just wanted to point you again down to the link to resources there. Uh, you can download that. It is uh, some links of uh, language revitalization information. Uh, a number of websites on reconciliation in Canada. These are all sort of Canadian resources, and also some key documents or educational resources there. So yeah, I'm sure we'll, we are available for questions. Thanks, Wendy and Melissa. Um, so I also added, um, for the American audience, to the resources, I added a um, racial healing framework that you can also take a look at and that should be helpful for individuals and organizations. Um, so with that, we have about 20 minutes for Q&A. So if you have any questions, feel free to type those in the chat box now. And um, while we wait for some 
responses. Uh, could you guys talk about how many hours this type of program took? Sure. Um, we, in, back in the timeline, you'll notice there is a few months gap uh, close to the beginning. And that's because we had to actually uh, find funding to get enough hours to be able to do this event. It was a very, um, very time consuming event. And so we applied for a grant and then had to wait a few months to see if we found it before we could proceed on with, with the event. So it took 64 hours in total for Melissa's program and event coordinator position to uh, plan, develop, and, and host this. And, and I helped as well because it was such a complex event. And I put in just a bit less time than that. So that's quite a lot. So it cost about roughly $2,000 in Melissa's wages just to work on this event. We could not have done that without the funding from Witsinkwa Community Forest Corporation. And of those hours, 43 hours were meetings, correspondence, and planning. Um, a few hours for promotion uh, hosting. We had seven hours per staff member. I think there were four of us there. And, um, and we then applied for another grant from Witsinkwa for 10 hours to write and present and distribute the report, which we'll be uh, writing and sharing in December. And feel free, if you're interested in seeing that report, to contact us in December, and we'd be happy to get a copy to you. Great, thank you. Um, so I've been seeing a few people typing in and off. Um, they might be formulating their questions. Um, in the meantime, you guys mentioned talking circles. Could you describe a little bit more about what that is? The talking circle, the, the, uh, the people who had attended this event, and then they came to me about a week or two later, and they wanted to share um, what they'd been thinking and planning since the event. Um, they didn't elaborate on that, but I know that um, Reconciliation Canada and the Truth and, and Reconciliation Commission have some videos out there with examples of church leaders and First Nations leaders coming together to talk about uh, the, the Indian residential schools and the damage and the healing and how can we move forward together. So um, I have witnessed clips of those online. And um, they, they, I don't know much, uh, I don't know many of the details, but it looks like they're just a very respectful and, and focused and purposeful um, discussion circles. And they look to be anywhere between six and 10 people with a facilitator, with a, an Indigenous facilitator. And um, the purpose seems to be, the tr the tr in Truth and Reconciliation, the truth has to come first. So first, you have to learn what happened. Then you have to acknowledge that it happened and accept that that happened. And only then can we start trying to find ways to move towards reconciliation and healing. And it's my sense that that's what the talking circles are about. Great. And we have a question from Lisa. Um, did you require a psychologist or mental health worker to attend um, the events where residential school survivors were sharing? I, I, I can just set that up. Well, I can just bri briefly speak to that in relation to, to our event, which wasn't uh, technically a, a talking circle. And we didn't have a residential school survivor sharing, although that was intended to be part of our event. But that individual wasn't able to, to be part of it uh, in the end. But in, in relation to all the personal stories that were shared, we, we did have uh, two mental health workers on hand. Uh, one was Aboriginal and one was a settler. And that was suggested very, very early on in the planning process by one of our partners, well, by the Bridging Committee and, and several partners, that if we're taking on an event of this nature, it was just imperative that we, we had support people on hand. So we, we did have that. And when that, um, 
the circumstance came up where the individual was, was interrupting the speaker and, and felt the need to speak, uh, the, our support people were really helpful in that moment. Great. Um, Follow-up question to that. Uh, how did you guys get connected with the um, uh, mental health workers that you had on hand? Uh, one of them happened to also be a, a speaker, and uh, yeah, that was it just fortuitous, <laughs> and so that was that was great. And the the other individual I, I happened to know through another library program, and it was also suggested that that she had been in you know had a good relationship with the First Nations community, so it seemed like a good fit. Great. Um, so it looks like we have a few more people um, typing in the chat box. Um, I think that you guys had a question that you kind of wanted to ask the chat if you... Oh, yes. I, I would really like to hear if anyone has, has done other events uh, on this topic. I'd like to see what form those took. So if, if you have done something else around reconciliation or bringing together um, groups in your community to better understand each other and build a stronger community, I, I'd love to hear what you've done. Um, so we have another question. Um, uh, you talked about some events with um, a group like Black Lives Matter. Uh, for the area that um, they live in, um, getting involved with that type of a group would start a counterattack with hate groups in the area. Do you have anything that you could suggest? Well, um, we're so lucky. <laughs> we're so lucky because um, we we hadn't even thought, we hadn't had to think about that. Um, so I don't know enough about your situation to actually make a suggestion. I do seem to recall that two or three years ago, there was um, a presentation by a librarian who, now let me see, it was a webinar, I can't recall who it was with, maybe someone listening today would remember, and, and this was a, a, it was a male librarian in the southern states where there'd been a great deal of um, uh, racial violence. And yes, Ferguson maybe, and they did, yeah, and they did a webinar on how their library responded to that and tried to keep their community safe. Um, so although that webinar might not answer the exact questions you have, I would strongly recommend looking for that webinar and, um, and going back through that. And I think that would probably be very useful for if you are planning to hold an event like that or even speaking to staff there. I, I found it fascinating at the time just how deeply involved they were with, with uh, keeping keeping the peace in their community, keeping uh, people safe. I, and just to tack on to that, um, I would also to suggest we have a webinar upcoming in um, next week, actually. And it's about dialogue and deliberation series for your community. And they'll be focusing specifically on um, safety and justice, um, their guide. So I would definitely check out that. Um, they, that guide in particular deals with Black Lives Matter, um, the uh, tension, racial tensions between um, with the police, and is helpful for creating conduct conducive dialogues with your community. Um, with that, we have another question uh, from Louise. Um, did the time required to organize the event impact the day-to-day -day operation of your library. One of the challenges their library experiences is not having enough staff to develop programming. So we never could have do we we could not have possibly 
put on, developed and put on this event without the grant money that we got. Um, because the grant money was all for Melissa's hours. And without that grant, her position does not exist. It's totally dependent upon this grant, which uh, we apply for each year. And this is only the third year we've applied for it. So it's never a sure thing. Um, and without that, we it would have been such a huge impact. Um, we just simply couldn't have found the hours. We couldn't have found the money to pay her for the number of hours it took to do this event. So yes. Just uh, just to, to add on to that, a couple of notes about um, impact beyond my position, which again was necessary, uh, is the the woman who run who manages the the promotions and and publicity side of things. She took on a lot more than she usually would to produce materials for this event, so it impacted her hours for sure and her her time. So there was there was that to consider. And also the day of, obviously, by closing the library for the day, that that affected operations for sure and regular patrons. Uh, but the board had agreed to that in advance, so just planning ahead for that, and like with with our promotions um, uh, employee, we we met with her quite early on, like a lot earlier than we would for for a smaller event to plan for that. Awesome. And I actually missed the question from Lisa. Um, do you guys have any dialogue or a cheat sheet on how to approach community partners or individuals? Um, let me just look back. I think maybe one of these slides. I could I could send you the notes, but that's really um, everything everything we know we, we put into this webinar. So those, that was uh, the, the summary of, of everything we learned during this process. My, my first thought ar around that would be that it, it really tailoring that to the group or to the individual. Like when I was talking about um, the partner that I met with and it was that huge paradigm shifting moment, I, I couldn't have gone in there really formally and, and started to establish the same relationship than I did with just really sitting there and being open and listening and being emotional. Whereas uh, when we were approaching, you know, the office, the local office of the hereditary chiefs, uh, that needed to be a bit more formal, and there was process there. So considering who you're, you know, adapting it to, to who you're approaching. And I see a question from Maxime um, asking about the grant that we received to do this event. So the grant was um, for Melissa's hours and program and event coordinator. It was from a local organization called the Witsinkwa Community Forest Corporation. And they pour a portion of their profits right back into the community. But um, so of course, that would only be available to us. But perhaps you can think of a, a similar organization in your community. And we like to match up that funding source with this particular position because of the wide range of people that benefit from all of the programs that we put on here. So they can really see, they, they can see that a, a, a great many people in the community are being um, getting a lot out of where they put their money. So look for something in your own community like that. We also received money from our Northwest Library Federation, and they paid for um, a lot of the costs excluding the wages. So the total event cost without the wages was $1,120. So that money was things like paying the traditional dr drumming group. Um, we hired a local person to make and bring bannock. We bought fruit and beverages. Um, printing the extra large posters, the trauma counselor's fee, the speaker gifts, and an honorarium for the chief's traditional welcome to the territory. And you guys actually had an interesting um, story about how to present the honorariums. Um, if you would be willing to talk a little bit about that, well, I see a few people have um, questions and are typing still. Sure, Melissa, you, you were doing that too. Want to speak to that? Yeah, uh, so we, we had all the, the packages prepared in advance with, with the cards written. And and basically, you know, after 
Well, we we had molded over. You know, do do we present them in the moment after each individual speaks, or you know, do we do it in the end? We knew we wanted to do it publicly, so I don't know if we got it. You know, if we got it right, but we did our best. Uh, so in the moment, we uh, gave the the gift to the local chief after she did her traditional welcome. But as for the just not to interrupt the flow continually, we just we let the rest of the program carry on. And then after the reflection period, when everyone was still in the room, we you know listed off the different speakers and gave them their gifts at that point when when people were still there to witness it. It was something different for us because uh, I'm used to paying people privately after everyone's left, sort of calling them aside and and um, giving them a, money in an envelope and that that. But when we sat down um, with one of the speakers, they they said that um, presenting the gift or even the envelope with, with the fee with the money in it in front of everyone at the time during the event is a way of honoring the person publicly and that it also honors everyone else from from that clan or nation publicly because they are connected and so it's a it's a very different sort of attitude towards it than i was used to Great, so we have about um, four minutes left. If there are any other um, last questions that you guys have, um, or uh, Melissa and Wendy, if there is any um, last minute takeaways that you would like to um, tell the group before we uh, end. Oh, I just wanted to acknowledge Louise's comment here about uh, the Returning to Spirit program. That looks like a wonderful resource for people to investigate. She just made a comment there. Yeah. I think they're running it in Hazleton um, in a few weeks, I believe. It's, uh, is that the one that lasts a few days? Do you recall something about that? Oh, I'm not sure. If you're talking to me, I'm not too sure. But I'm hoping we use new information to me. Yeah. I'm also hoping I see Tara Williston. Yes, yeah, a few days mm -hmm. long. Tara Williston's typing. She's the director at the Hazelton Public Library down the road here. And I attended um, a reconciliation event there this summer. I'm hoping she might mention what what they did. Did something? Yes, excellent. Mm -hmm. Right. So. Thanks, Tara, for putting that in there. This was a, a different event that was really wonderful. And uh, the Hazelton Public Library had a vast, <laughs> vast roster of people each come up and read part of the 94 calls to action. And uh, they had, um, they matched the readers to the area that they worked in or represented, whether it was health or education or politics or youth. And uh, I, it was it was wonderful. Uh, I had read the 94 Calls to Action to myself before, but I'd never actually slowed down and had it sink in and stay with me in the same way as, uh, as sitting there with with them being read to me by different individuals. That was excellent. Could, could I end, perhaps, with a quote? Sure. Uh, and at the Aboriginal Awareness Training I went to, I, I wrote down this quote because it, it resonated with me. Reconciliation will not be one grand, finite act. It will be a multitude of small acts and gestures played out between individuals. And that was by Ed Gamblin. And so I guess just thinking, you know, we're, we're talking about, you know, statewide, province-wide, national partnerships and all of that. But at the same time, to really keep in mind, for me, it's myself in the office with that partner listening to his story. So, like, think about the individual, just that, you know, that, that one comment, that one feedback, you know, comment that we got, making it all worth it. So just keeping that in mind.
Great, and with that, we'll go ahead and close out the session. Um, a huge thank you to Wendy and Melissa for this presentation, and of course, for all of you for joining us. Um, this webinar is going to be available for viewing on Programming Librarian in about 24 hours. Thank you. Thank you.